and uh, their understanding of virology. So I hope with this presentation, many of you would benefit in understanding nitty-gritty of virology and the common problems we face in our practice. So I would uh, uh, like to speak on um, uh, certain aspects of urology. And it's very difficult for me to cover whole urology in half an hour time. Uh, the most important problems we face in our practice are uh, urinary tract infection, hematuria, whether it is gross or microscopic, uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia in elderly men, uh, catheter care, how should we take a look after a patient who is having a urinary catheter or folly catheter. Then stone a disease, common management and incontinence mostly in women, elderly women who have uh, uh, stress or urge incontinence. The first and foremost thing, like uh, I'm not sure whether you are doing any dipstick test but in our institute also, we are not doing any dipstick test, but in West, it is a common practice uh, for urologists or in their offices, whosoever is coming uh, to see a urologist, he or she has uh, his or her urine examination by dip, dipstick test. But we do get uh, urine examined as a, as a routine microscopy. So which is the first and foremost thing in urology. And urine routine microscopy, the understanding of a report is very important because it can tell us a lot of positive things uh, in patients who are presenting to even a general practitioner. He may not go to a urologist, but general practitioner or any other physician can uh, pick any problem related to urology. I have seen uh, that most of the physicians, uh, they give importance to crystals in urine, which has uh, no clinical significance unless urine crystals are of cysteine, which indicate cysteine stone. But most of the time, you see a lot of uh, urine crystal in urine routine microscopy. And I don't think they have any clinical significance. The second important thing which you should look for uh, in urine routine microscopy is number of pus cells. The normal pus cell count is taken as uh, three and sometimes five. So if you have more than that number of pus cells, even if patient is not symptomatic, Mind you, if patient has a lower urinary tract symptoms with increased pus cell, or it is obvious that he or she has a lower urinary tract infection. But if the person, if the patient is not symptomatic, then presence of pus cell indicates, I mean, it should raise a suspicion of uh, tuberculosis, particularly in developing countries. Then comes protein. Uh, urine protein is a very important indicator of uh, so many diseases. Uh, it is very important to know, particularly uh, being, a, being a general physician, you should, uh, when, you are, when you are seeing a, a person in that age range where general uh, conditions like hypertension, diabetes uh, are very common. So most of these systemic diseases affect kidneys and uh, they may manifest uh, in form of presence of protein in urine. And of course, in, in our part of country, and uh, I'm sure in many developing countries, uh, patients are presenting with uh, urine with white discoloration, this condition called chyluria. It is an endemic condition, uh, more so when filariasis is, is prevalent. So when you are doing dipstick test, any dipstick test done for protein, if it is positive or if it is showing traces, it has some significance. Like you can see the traces would mean a protein, urinary protein of more than 30 milligram per day, which is of some clinical significance. 
Normally, you can have protein in a normal, absolutely normal person, but uh, the level of protein may not be more than 30 milligram. So if dipstick test is showing a positive, that means traces, if it is shows traces, that means patient has some kind of significant proteinuria and you should uh, get his urine routine microscopy done. Similarly for RBCs and uh, WBCs, if dipstick test, if you're not doing routine microscopy and you're just doing dipstick test, if dipstick test is positive for bacteriuria or hematuria, we do not give significance to that in terms of starting treatment or starting investigating uh, the patient, but we should get urine routine microscopy once uh, uh, we get a positive dipstick. So dipstick test does help in terms of telling you whether patient needs further routine microscopy when it shows positive results for uh, bacteria or hematuria. So first thing, uh, let's talk about hematuria. I'm sure you must be seeing patients uh, coming to your offices with uh, passage of blood in urine. It, if it is gross, then immediately you should proceed with the work of which I will, I will, I will just brief you in, in, in uh, forthcoming slides. But if it is microscopic, like you detected in a dipstick or routine microscopy, if it is microscopic hematuria, which is defined as uh, RBCs of more than three RBCs per uh, high power field, then uh, it becomes significant. Uh, this chart may not be clear to you, but uh, I must tell you, like, if you are seeing a person who is more than 40 years, and if he's not having high risk, uh, if he's not falling in high risk category, like a person who is a smoker, a person who is working in industries uh, which deal with uh, lead painting or asbestos, so uh, they, they have a high likelihood of uh, developing malignancies and thereby showing microscopic or gross hematuria. If the person is not falling in that category and if he's less than 40 years and he's, if he's having microscopic hematuria, that means RBCs of more than three high power uh, field, then you should definitely evaluate him by ordering uh, three-phase uh, contrast CT or multi-detector CT. So imaging is a first thing you should do. Then comes uh, the cystoscopy, which is a mandatory part of, uh, part of evaluation if you are finding significant microscopic immaturia. And if a patient has gross immaturia, then there is no doubt that you should be doing uh, uh, these two again and cystoscopy forms uh, the cornerstone of uh, investigation and you should rather refer the per patient to a urologist if, if, uh, if you find uh, uh, urine positive for microscopic to get three uh, multi-detector CT scan and to get cystoscopy. So that is all about uh, hematuria because uh, once you, at least you can help the patient by uh, detecting whether he is having microscopic hematuria or not. And if he has, then uh, you can at least refer the patient to the urologist and urologist can further evaluate him to detect the cause and treat the cause accordingly. The second important condition you must be seeing in your practice is uh, urinary tract infection. Now this could be of upper urinary tract uh, that would be infection of kidneys, we call it pyelonephritis. Then the lower tract could be either cystitis, bacterial, then cystitis tubercular as I earlier uh, mentioned that if person is not symptomatic or if even if he's symptomatic and his culture is sterile, but his pus cells are growing in the urine, you should suspect tuberculosis. 
than other two conditions which are very specific uh, to the urologist, but at least by ruling out initial two, you can suspect that is interstitial cystitis. And of course, if patient has received radiation, then you should suspect radiation cystitis. The pyelonephritis is a clinical diagnosis. You practically don't need any imaging to diagnose this condition uh, to begin with. So any person who presents with high-grade fever, with chills, and a loin pain, and if you demonstrate uh, tenderness at the renal angle, this, this uh, indicates a diagnosis of a pyelonephritis. And of course, you can substantiate it with ultrasonography, basic test, and uh, urine routine microscopy. And uh, accordingly, you can start a common antibiotic and then refer the patient to uh, urologist. But if pyelonephritis is associated with high-grade fever, patients may need admission also. So what about uh, uh, patients who are on catheter? Like a, a person or a patient is with the folly catheter, he has 10% risk of developing febrile UTI every day. Every day the risk uh, rises if if uh, he's on indwelling catheter. So, like in, in patients who are not able to evacuate their bladder, they need a clean intermittent catheterization. That is, uh, patients by themselves pass catheter into the bladder to empty the bladder. So this has a significantly lesser chance of giving the patient infection. So if you are dealing with a person, a patient with a catheter in your outdoor or maybe, uh, I'm sure you may be having indoor patients with urinary catheters for various reasons, for surgery or for other illnesses. So I would uh, share with you important points uh, which would benefit the patient uh, uh, for the sake of reduction in urinary tract infection. So the best system of drainage is a closed draining system, which I'll show you the picture later on. And uh, what we practice in our wards, that whosoever is having catheter, we try to put, though there is no uh, clinical uh, level one evidence to prove that this helps, but uh, precautionary, we put betadine or hydrogen peroxide in the euro bag. And Certain points, it would be better if I, if, I, if I show you the pictures. Like, this is the way a uh, folly catheter should be fixed in children or even in adults, so that even if catheter is being pulled, the effect of pull is not uh, on the bladder neck. So, this is the most important point one should look for. The catheter should not hang without a support. And this is another way to fix the catheter at the medial part of the thigh. So catheter should be fixed. Fixation of catheter is very important. The second thing is the position of the bag should be lower so that it drains urine by gravity, but should not lift the euro bag up because this may cause regurgitation of the urine. Though most of the euro bags have safety valve, but you should not completely rely on that. And uh, urine may regurgitate and go back to the bladder and cause infection. One of the most common mistakes uh, we have seen people committing, even in, in, in our setup, uh, in the wards which are not urology wards, when they send culture for, uh, when they send a urine sample for culture, they just open the euro bag from the folly and take sample for the culture. This is a wrong method of taking urine sample for culture. And this is also one of the method which is absolutely wrong. One should not take sample like this to send the sample for culture. The best way is to 
clamp the drainage, the Euro bag tube, clean the part of the folly, and after some time, you just uh, pull the urine sample or just draw the urine sample uh, from the folly tip. This is this is an ideal method of taking uh, urine sample for culture. And when the stakes are high, particularly a pediatric patient, because you need to know the colony count, uh, suprapubic aspiration is also one of the ways uh, to take urine sample. This is what I was talking about, closed and open drainage system. You should uh, try to avoid uh, this kind of situation by keeping the uh, uh, cap of this zero bag open. You should not keep this cap open. And always preferable to have a euro bag with, with, with a drainage which is lower down. These are very, very small points, but they are really significant points which can uh, cut down the infection rate in your admitted patients. Another thing which uh, usually we get uh, uh, call for is that somebody tried to put in a catheter and uh, catheter did not go, rather blood came out uh, from the urethra. It's inflation of the balloon inside the urethra. So the trick of the tread is you should make sure that once you put the folly catheter in, inside the bladder completely, until unless it drains urine, you should not inflate the balloon. Now, this is a situation. The tip has gone into the bladder, but if you, you haven't uh, put the folly catheter completely in, and you just made sure that urine is coming out, you inflate the balloon, it still can injure the urethra, because the tip is just inside the bladder which is draining the urine. So there are two things. You should put the folly catheter completely in and the second thing is that it should drain urine before you inflate the balloon. Now let's talk about uh, uh, one of the common problems uh, uh, we face in our practice in elderly men. Excuse me. The, uh, in our uh, medical school days, uh, we used to read a uh, uh, lot about uh, prostatism. Now, this was the common term. Any any man in a elderly age group coming to our practice with lower urinary tract symptoms, we used to diagnose uh, them having prostatism. Now, this term is no longer used in urological literature. So, prostatism has been uh, replaced with term called lower urinary tract symptoms, LUTS. This is a uh, most commonly used term instead of prostatism. Because men in elderly age group, if they are having urinary difficulties, that may not be because of prostate itself. That could be because of bladder dysfunction also, or maybe some urethral pathology. So prostatism uh, indirectly indicates pathology of prostate. That's the reason uh, the broader category of terminology is utilized, that is lower urinary tract symptoms, or LUTs. As I said, prostatism indicates problems because of prostate which is not likely. So broadly, the low urinary tract symptoms are classified as because of a uh, problem because of bladder, that is a detrusor aging process. I mean, as you grow old, there are uh, changes in the urinary bladder muscle and urinary bladder function. So the low urinary tract symptoms could be because of that. The most common uh, presentation is overactive bladder. Then associated neurological diseases, maybe diabetic neuropathy. And then comes the prostate itself. That's called benign prostatic hyperplasia. So if person is presenting with lower urinary tract symptoms, he can have overactive bladder because of the changes in the bladder or bladder outlet obstruction. This could be because of the prostate 
or because of the urethral stricture. So that's the reason it is called bladder outlet obstructions. If it is because of prostate, then it is called bladder prostatic obstruction. And these two conditions like overactive bladder and bladder outlet obstruction can coexist together also. So suppose uh, you are uh, you are you are seeing a person with uh, urinary symptoms. Now how should you how should you proceed uh, to uh, at least know what problem he or he could have before uh, referring him to the urologist? So there is a thing called AU symptom score. Uh, I'm sure you are aware of that. And the second is a quality of uh, life index. Then comes a medical history to see for other causes of voiding dysfunction. There are so many causes which could lead to uh, lower urinary tract symptoms. You should look for those. And dietary and fluid intake, like we have seen many patients coming to us saying that they are peeing a lot, they are passing urine very frequently, and they are disturbed. They cannot sleep during the night. When you take detailed history, you find that they are taking a lot of fluid uh, before they are going off to sleep. So that could be the reason. If you take a lot of fluid, obviously you will have frequency of urine. This is a simple thing. If you don't ask, you may start treating the person with medicine. And of course, history of previous surgery, previous urinary problems, and a family history of prostatic problem. The American Urological Association Symptom Index, it, it, it comprises of basically seven symptoms uh, with score of 0 to 5, like frequency, how often you go to the loo, incomplete emptying, then intermittency, this is, this is the flow, reduction in flow, urgency, weak stream, hesitancy, and nocturia. So th th these are the seven symptoms. So basically, uh, this nocturia, urgency, and frequency. These three are usually called storage symptoms because bladder is not able to store urine. So patients are having frequency, urgency, and nocturia. And rest four, like incomplete emptying, intermittency, weak stream and hesitancy are called voiding uh, symptoms. So storage symptoms and voiding symptoms, they comprise together as lower urinary tract symptoms. So mind you, these symptoms you can find in females also. That's the reason the term prostatism uh, has been uh, has has been uh, is it prostatism is not used quite often because these symptoms you can find in females also. So uh, every symptom is given score from zero to five, and the total score comes to thirty-five. And And there is another, uh, another aspect of looking at it, like I know people who may be having avoiding uh, symptoms, like their stream is not good, they are, going, uh, they, they are going to pee with a very poor flow and uh, with an intermittent flow, but despite that, they are not unhappy. They are used to that kind of uh, avoiding uh, habit. So. If a patient is not bothered about his symptoms, and as a physician, if I find that he doesn't have any other problem which warrants surgical treatment, then I would not like to treat him. So this is called quality of life index. You need to assess that even if you like, you give him a AUS score and he ticks certain points and you calculate the score as 20. You may think that his score is quite high. Let's start giving him uh, treatment. But if you honestly ask him whether he's bothered about these symptoms or not, if he's not bothered, 
then you may not try to treat that patient for these symptoms. So this is what it's called quality of life index. This ranges from 0 to 6. 6 is terrible. If he's having a UA score of 7 or maybe t a 10 and he's bothered, he's very much bothered. He doesn't want to tolerate even slightest disturbance at uh, voiding, uh, voiding habit. So you need to treat uh, uh, that patient because he's terrible with his symptoms. So this is very important aspect before uh, we take decision in treating uh, BPH. So AUA symptom score is broadly categorized into mild symptoms, moderate symptoms when the AUA score is 8 to 19, and more than 20 severe symptoms. And the quality of life index, of course, 0 to 6, delighted to terrible. So once you calculate the symptom index and categorize his symptoms into three categories, then comes the physical examination. The first and foremost uh, examination, I am sure most of us are forgetting the significance of clinical examination, but I must assure you that this thing you should never forget. You, despite having uh, excellent imaging these days, there is no substitute to physical examination. So general examination is part of it. Then the important specific examination you should do is you should look for uh, palpable bladder. Because if a person is coming to you and saying, I'm passing urine every hour and a small amount of urine is is, 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 is going out, that this could be because of overflow incontinence. His bladder is full and he is just passing 20, 30 or 40 ml of urine and again 40 ml urine is formed and fills up the bladder, then he has to go again. So this is called overflow problem. So he, that may present with frequency and if you don't examine that, you may miss the palpable bladder. And of course, genitalia, which is the most important thing. In elderly men, particularly in diabetic men, you need to look at his penis to see for phimosis, because this is very common in uh, elderly gentlemen. Uh, phimosis can itself produce obstructive wiring symptoms. And of course, relevant neurological examination and digital rectal examination to feel for prostate. So after that, uh, as a urologist or maybe as a, as, a, as a practitioner, the basic taste you can order. I'm sure uh, urine is one of them, but you may not have urophlometry, but you can order, uh, you can uh, get his ultrasonography and urine culture if you feel that he's having dysuria or symptoms related to lower tract, uh, urinary tract infection. And PSA is, uh, which is the most controversial thing, uh, because in Western world, um, PSA screening is debatable. But I'm sure in, 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 in developing countries, like in India, we do not have PSA screening. But we do opportunistic, opportunistic screening. So whosoever is coming to urology office, or uh, those guys who are getting their executive checkup done, they are having their PSA tested. And if, if, if you feel that the gentleman has any kind of infection, you should not order PSA because infection can spuriously elevate the PSA level and you would unnecessarily put uh, that person under tension because his PSA is high because of infection. So you, if even if you are ordering PSA, just make sure that he is not having uh, any indication of uh, lower urinary tract infection. This is just to tell you about urophlow battery. This is an objective assessment of poor flow. A person says, my flow is poor, it's intermittent. I haven't seen his stream, but this is an objective test to tell you like what is what parameters we look for on urophlometry, like uh, 
the voided volume, how much volume he has passed, how much volume of urine he has voided. This is significant because if he hasn't passed uh, 150, at least 125, 150 uh, mils, then this reading could be spurious. So the normal uh, urine flow is, uh, normal curve is like a bell-shaped curve. So there is a peak which is achieved and the time to that peak. So the peak of that bell-shaped curve is called Q max. That the Q means flow, maximum flow. Then th comes the average flow and time to maximum flow. So what we are interested is uh, in is maximum flow rate. And this gentleman, this curve is not bell-shaped. So he's having obstructive symptoms. Normally we take uh, Q max of less than 15 as obstructive. So his uh, Q max or the maximum uh, flow rate, maximum flow rate is around 11.6. And he has voided 645 mils of urine. And there should be one value of residue. How much urine is remaining in the bladder? That's called post void residue. It is also very important to know that because that has a different implication. So his bladder capacity seems to be good and he's passing urine at the maximum flow rate of 11.6 milliliter per second. As I said, post wide residue is very important parameter. So even if person is voiding and his post wide residue is high, it, it raises a suspicion that his detrusor muscle is not as active as it should be. So you need to be careful uh, for uh, future therapy for this gentleman. Uh, this is a urologist domain, urodynamic study. Uh, there are situations where we need to know the bladder pressure, like if a person who is diabetic for 10 years together and he is coming to us with, uh, uh, with voiding dysfunction, or if a person has uh, dysprotrusion, or a person has any kind of neurological disorder. Those, those are the situations where we need to know the pressure inside the bladder. Because, you know, a person, a, a, a gentleman of 60 years of age is having obstructive voiding symptoms, and we just diagnose him as a case of uh, BPH without going into the detail whether he's diabetic, whether he's having some neurological problem, and we haven't got his urodynamic study done. But if I do surgery on him, then he may still be having similar problems because the problem was not in the prostate, but the problem was in the bladder. So, uh, from a urologist's uh, point of view, I must share with you, at least you should know, what are the treatment, uh, how should we approach. Uh, you may or may not treat that person or you better to refer that person to a urologist, but at least you should know the way we treat uh, such patients. Unless there are absolute indications, like there are four or five absolute indications where uh, patient, need, patient needs surgery, like if he's having voiding symptoms with urinary retention. Some urologists may give him catheter-free trial. Suppose this is a young gentleman with one-time retention and rest of the parameters they are looking okay you may give him a catheter free trial by giving him some medical treatment and by removing the catheter to watch whether he's able to pass urine or not but there is 60 percent chance a patient goes into retention and you give him a trial and observe him with medical treatment that he will go again into retention I suppose a person with obstructive symptoms is having recurrent urinary tract infection or if his creatine is raised with bilateral hydroeternephrosis or if he's having associated uh, bladder stroke or if he's having recurrent hematuria. Mind you, the BPH itself can cause hematuria because the large prostate uh, because of vascular endothelial growth factor overactivity. The BPH is just at a hyperplasia. So that may result in hematuria in less than 5% of the patients. So BPH per se can cause 
hematuria. So these are the five absolute indications where you should consider the patient for surgery. Otherwise, there is a strong indication for treating patients with either watchful waiting or medical treatment. So if there are no absolute indications than watchful wearing if his symptom scores are mild and he is not bothered about his symptoms as I told you the quality of life index which varies from 0 to 6 if he is not bothered you just keep him under watch or if his symptoms are moderate or severe then you can put him on medical treatment this is for watchful wearing when this patient has a US symptom score of 7 or less, the quality of life index score is important, as I earlier mentioned. So, this is basically patient choice. The treatment of BPH is patient's choice. Ideally, a urologist should not take the decision of treatment unless there are absolute indications. As I said, person has to decide, a patient has to decide whether he needs treatment or not. So if patient has moderate to severe symptom score and his prostate volume is small and his PSA is low, then only alpha adrenergic receptor blocker are sufficient. The volume is less means if it is less than 30 grams. This is an top trial which has shown that if the prostate volume is less than 30 gram, only alpha blockers can help the patient in alleviating symptoms. But if volume is high, is more than 30 grams, you can combine alpha blocker with 5-alpha uh, reductase inhibitor. It's called deuterosteride or finasteride. Deuterosteride is a much better and potent uh, file for reductase inhibitor than uh, finasteride. So there are l uh, lots of uh, combination available uh, in the market with tamsulosin and alfazosin. They, they come alone and uh, with the combination uh, with deuterosteride. And there is a, there is a uh, recent uh, upsurge in use of silodosin which is considered to be the most potent alpha-1 receptor blocker but uh, this comes with side effect too because it causes uh, an ejaculation in around 40 percent of the patient so if patient is sexually active this mind you alpha blockers you need to be careful even if you're writing alpha blockers to patients who are fit for a medical treatment then you need to be careful about prescribing them because silodosin should not be given to a patient who is sexually active. So as I said combination therapy of alpha blockers and uh, phi alpha reductase inhibitors men with symptomatic BPH with a large prostate of more than 40 grams and other risk factors which which tell you that patient may have increased risk of retention and these are the factors which a urologist should consider before starting uh, the patient on uh, combination therapy. Uh, it's unfortunate that I'm not able to see you but if you have any query uh, or any question you can stop me and I can answer happily to any question or I can continue with that. It's almost 30 minutes. Okay, let's let's uh, discuss about the stone disease. I think I have 40 more slides, but I don't think I'll be able to complete it today itself. But let's. Uh, yeah, any question in between?
Okay, so I think uh, there are no questions from your side. Anyway, so stone disease is another facet in the urology which is not managed uh, properly by most of our physicians. Unfortunately, there are a lot of bits regarding stones, uh, the dietary precautions which uh, are wrongly followed. Uh, they have no scientific basis. So, I'll share with you the broad aspects of treatment or managing a case of stone disease. Now, stone usually may come to you because, you know, if a person has, is having colicky pain, he may not uh, see urologist to begin with. He'll have to go to a general physician or general practitioner. So, if you are seeing a patient with renal colic. Renal colic typically the pain starts from loin to groin or maybe uh, from lumbar to iliac fossa with urinary symptoms. Most often they are associated with urinary symptoms and obviously you will get his urine uh, routine microscopy done and if it shows a microscopic hematuria that confirms, almost confirms uh, diagnosis uh, of uh, renal colic. Pain typical pain of severity and location with microscopic epicuria and urinary tract symptoms. So acute colic, when you are suspecting it, the ideal uh, imaging of choice is uh, NCCT, non-contrast enhanced CT scan. And if you don't have that facility, ultrasonography and X-ray QB are also sufficient, but they should be combined together. If a patient is having chronic pain, and hematuria and you are suspecting stone on ultrasonography or KUB x-ray. The next imaging would be in western world nowadays nobody does intravenous uh, urogram but in India particularly I prefer doing intravenous urogram if I suspect uh, a patient having a renal or any other kind of stone because this is cheaper it gives less radiation a properly done IVU intravenous urogram from a urologist perspective is as good as a contrast enhanced CT. CCT is expensive and it of course gives more radiation than intravenous urogram. So once you see a patient of ureteric colic then you need to treat him with analgesic and uh, IV fluids and uh, treating him conserv conservatively. Uh, just for your knowledge sake, we divide a ureter into three parts. Radiologically, ureter is divided as upper ureter from uh, uh, kidney to upper SI joint. The mid ureter is upper SI joint to lower SI joint and lower ureter is to lower SI joint to UV junction. So upper ureteric stone, if a person is upper ureteric stone and his kidney is functioning, which you will get to know once you treat his colic and you will get to know with imaging either CT or IVP, IVU. Upper ureteric stone of less than one centimeter are best treated with lithotripsy. This is for your knowledge sake. At least you can guide the patient correctly and you can refer him to a urologist. At least you can judge the urologist also in your community whether he is practicing right science or not. So this, this, this is based on um, uh, level 1 evidence that upper ureteric stone of less than 1 centimeter is best treated with lithotripsy. A more than 1 centimeter ureteroscopy, mid ureter and lower ureteric stone they are best treated with uh, ureteroscopy. Lithotripsy could be a choice but standard of care is ureteroscopy. Any stone of more than 2 cm endoscopic treatment is not warranted and particularly for this big stone. The choice would be laparoscopic ureterolithotomy or open ureterolithotomy is not a bad choice either. This is about uh, renal stone. This is large stag horn in the right kidney. The eye view shows a functioning kidney with good 
excretion of contrast into the pelvic LSL system. Left kidney is also good functioning. With such a big stone, uh, we usually counsel the patient uh, for at least two sitting of percutaneous nephrolithotomy, which is the way one should treat a renal stone. I think we hardly cut open the stone, cut open the patient for stone. Open surgery is invariably not indicated for treating uh, renal stone. So if you feel that patient is having a renal stone, it's better to refer him to a urologist rather than to a surgeon who is going to cut him open for removal of the stone. So after percutaneous nephrolith nephrolithotomy, so this, this big stone with uh, two punctures, this is the first sitting and complete clearance after the second sitting. So two sitting of percutaneous nephrolithotomy, we could remove the whole stone. IVU, you may or may not be able to understand uh, some peculiar situations, but uh, for your knowledge sake, uh, there are stones in diverticulum. Now, if you see, this is the normal pelvic elicial system anatomy. This is the superior calyx, middle calyx, inferior calyx. This is again superior calyx, middle, inferior. So, this is an outpouching from the calyx. This is called diverticulum. So, this is the diverticular stone and diverticular, di diverticular stones are not treated with lithotripsy. They are best managed with uh, uh, percutaneous nephrolithotomy or we call it PCNL or PNL. Again, the bladder stone, the bladder stone of various sizes. The incidence of bladder stone is going down gradually. We don't see them a lot. But in elderly people with, uh, with the BPH or any altered obstruction or malnourished children, we do see bladder stone. So bladder stone, if they are of more than six centimeter size, we open, we do open cystal lithotomy. And less than six centimeter size, we either manage them transurethrally or percutaneous cystal lithotomy by puncturing the suprapubic area, uh, putting the nephroscope, breaking the stone with either lithoclost, a mechanical energy source, or laser energy source, and uh, removing the fragments uh, through the sheath or through the urethra. So endoscopically, these stones could be managed, but there is always a limit. Beyond six centimeter, it is always safe to do open surgery. There are different kinds of stone, the soft stones which are not uh, uh, radio opaque, the metric stone, they are also managed with percutaneous nephrolithotopy. Like I said, urologists in last two decades have seen a lot of advances in, uh, in surgery like uh, PCNL, uh, different urethroscopies, flexible urethroscopies, you might have heard of RIRS, retrograde intrarenal surgery. The renal stones are being treated by putting a flexible urethroscope from the urethra. They can reach the kidney with a smaller scope and break the stone with laser fiber. So there are a lot of advances uh, uh, in, in uh, management of various urological diseases. And of course, the robot is one of them. But with these advances come complications also. So this is one of the complications uh, of PCNL or PNL when you puncture the kidney, dilate the tract, take out the stone, there is always a risk of puncturing segmental artery and vein and causing either aneurysm or AV fistula. So once you remove the stone, patient goes home and he invariably comes back with hematuria, gross hematuria. So any patient who is coming back with hematuria after percutaneous procedure is having either aneurysm or AV fistula. So this is, uh, and the only treatment is uh, percutaneous 
uh, NG embolization. So you should also see at your community if a urologist is doing percutaneous nephrolithotomy or PCNL, he should have facility of uh, angioembolization too. Otherwise, you may lose uh, the whole kidney if patient comes back with uh, hematuria. So this, this is a, a, a renal angiogram. You can see the flush of contrast. This is the aneurysm. And after passage of the coil, this aneurysm was blocked. So we could save the kidney. This is another dreaded complication of PCNL, particularly when your puncture is above the uh, rib. This is uh, effusion. The urine is going into the pleural cavity. And this can be managed with uh, uh, passage of tube. It's called chest tube. So this is all about stone and um, uh, I was talking to you about dietary precautions. Uh, as of now, unfortunately, despite uh, science being uh, so advanced, we don't understand the exact mechanism of stone formation. So there are metabolically active stones like in hyperparathyroidism, which is the only condition where stone can be cured, stone disease could be cured by taking care of uh, parathyroid gland. Apart from that, and of course the cysteine stone or maybe some congenital disorders of renal tubular acidosis or hyperoxyluria. In India, most of the stones are calcium oxalate stone, unlike in West where you see uh, phosphate stone also. We, in 90-95% of our patients are having calcium oxalate stone and they are idiopathic. We do not understand the exact mechanism. So, as far as diet precaution goes, we do not advise them to restrict calcium. Rather, they should take adequate calcium one. We should advise them, we advise them to restrict protein. Unfortunately, in develop, developing countries where most of Indians are vegetarian, there is no role of restriction of protein because they are already having less amount of protein. The only advice we give to them is to drink water or liquid to produce at least 1.5 to 2 liters of urine and drink water in the night before going off to sleep so that they can wake up once during the night time to pee. So the, the, the eight hours of stasis is avoided. So this is uh, a very important uh, instruction we share with the patient. Rest all other myths related to diet are really myths. They do not have scientific basis. Uh, citrate is inhibitor of stone formation. So we advise them to increase the intake of citrus fruits. That can help in preventing um, calcium oxalate stone formation. So this is about uh, dietary precaution. and. Uh, Let's talk about uh, urinary incontinence. This is a much more common problem in women. And uh, I'm sure you must be seeing women coming to you, to your office with uh, urine leak. Unfortunately, in India and other developing countries, women, they don't come forward uh, because uh, they are not quite f forthright with uh, the problems related to urine or lower genitourinary tract. So they just conceal uh, uh, this problem. They are not, uh, they're not uh, open to discussing problems related to lower urinary tract. But this is a very common problem, which unfortunately we uh, see in our practice. So any, any woman who is coming with urinary leak, the broadly she may be having stress urinary incontinence or overactive bladder. You can easily make out with the history whether this incontinence is associated with urge to pass urine. A patient, if, if a female is, uh, is having urge to pass urine and she leaks before going to the loo, 
that means she is having urge incontinence and if she leaks with the cough or rising from uh, the bed from lying down to sitting a posture or maybe some exercise that is invariably associated with stress urinary incontinence and in some women these two incontinences can coexist a woman can have stress urinary incontinence and overactive bladder too so if you are seeing a female with incontinence you should rule out neurogenic causes of incontinence you, this is as i said the examination is the best thing if you really want to refer to the patient with with a very nice uh, notes written then urologist would be happy to see uh, and read your notes that you know about this problem and you have at least done the preliminary work so this is uh, the examination part and uh, other other important things which you should look for uh, the non neurogenic uh, reasons for incontinence this is about the prevalence this is not indian data this is western data you see the incontinence in women can affect their quality of life tremendously this could affect their physical social i mean they just can't make friends if they are leaking urine or they are having urgency they can't travel they can't travel in public transport unless public transport uh, uh, has a lavatory it can be a domestic problem problem with your spouse sexual and psychological so it's a it's a, it's a very real and big problem now i'll 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 explain to you with with an example like if if you are seeing a 50 year old female who comes with frequent urination and often can't make it to the bathroom in time and staying home more often than not that means she is having urge incontinence with the history you can at least suspect that she is having overactive bladder you don't need any major imaging to diagnose this even history is very important so now you know that she is having overactive bladder now how should i approach to this lady of of course you will do the general assessment then again physical examination and uh, if you are well versed with uh, looking at the vaginal mucosa the health of the vaginal mucosa you should see it and of course the basic test in lithotomy you will ask her to cough and if she uh, leaks urine on coughing that means she is having stress incontinence too in men if they are presenting with incontinence you need to assess other symptoms related to bph and of course smoking if the patient is taking diuretic or if he or she is having diabetes insipidus this is the mnemonic to rule out uh, transient causes of uh, urinary leak uh, the mnemonic is diapers d stands for delirium infection atrophy pharmaceutical psycho psychological endocrine or excess urine output restricted mobility and stool impaction mind you the constipation is one of the important factors for lower urinary tract symptoms in elderly particularly after the age of 60 70 uh, constipation per se can give rise to obstructive urinary symptoms these are the common uh, drugs which can cause incontinence the anticholinergic alpha agonist alpha antagonist the diuretics as i said earlier sedative hypnotics and cns depressant very important if you are seeing a lady with incontinence it is so th this is the bladder diary it's very important tool you should uh, at least ask patient to fill this this is about the total intake and you can find it on net this is very important part of evaluating a female uh, who is coming with uh, urinary leak 
Uh, laboratory tests, you don't need much uh, to diagnose this, the basic uh, tests which we have already have discussed. And urodynamic study, you may need it if your medical treatment, initial treatment is, is failed. Of course, this is not your domain. Uh, a urologist has to decide. So let me, because you know, th th this involves uh, basically urologist care. But the thing which I must share with you is uh, this is a certain knowledge about anticholinergic drug, which you may be prescribing or you must have seen urologists uh, prescribing these uh, anticholinergic drugs. There are a lot of anticholinergic uh, drugs. So basically, the idea is to pacify the bladder. The bladder contraction is a function of. Uh, Parasympathomimetic system. So it's a cholinergic system. So any drug which is blocking uh, the action of acetylcholin. So there are three kinds of receptors for acetylcholin activity M1, M2, M2, M3. The mostly uh, the bladder has M2 and M3 receptors, and brain has M1 receptors. So most of the anticholinergics, they affect all these receptors. So if they are they are affecting bladder indirectly. They affect salivary glands, brain, heart, and produce side effects. So uh, I would share with you certain names like uh, you must have uh, pre prescribed oxybutynin, then tolteridin, the latest one, solifenacin, darifenacin, and fesoteridin. Now, how to choose between these uh, anticholinergic drugs? Just to give you some idea. An elderly person, it is always better to avoid anticholinergic drugs which affect M1 receptor also. Like, you need not uh, uh, give patient a drug which affects M1 receptor in the brain because that will affect uh, elderly person's uh, cognitive function, the function of thinking, memory. It does affect these two important things at that, that age. So you need to be careful uh, in, in, in taking decision about the agent. So in, in nutshell, if you are prescribing anticholinergic drug in elderly, most of uh, uh, our patients who come with urinary leak are elderly. So derifenacin is, is, is a safer uh, anticholinergic than the rest of it. And the another one is uh, trospium chloride, which does not cause, uh, d does not cross blood-brain barrier. So that these two are safer in elderly people, uh, efficacy-wise and uh, side effect-wise also. So these two should be uh, preferred over uh, rest of the anticholinergic drugs. And of course, you should try giving these uh, drugs for a month or six weeks, and if they are not responding, then comes the role of uh, urologist in form of either botulinum toxin or even a surgical treatment. So these are the last steps which urologists need to think, but basically your role should come to properly evaluate the patient and make a particular diagnosis and refer uh, the patient to the urologist. I think uh, that's all I have uh, uh, for this session, and I would uh, welcome any question from your side. And thank you very much.